to be one of God's hunting dogs. There's so many, so many who need help, and we trample over them in our zeal to be religious. Keep your eyes open. You never know when the Lord's going to let you cross the path of somebody he's dealing with, and they're wounded, and they need help. Mr. Spurgeon had 300 hunting dogs, he called them. They were constantly on the lookout for somebody whom the Spirit had wounded, and they needed help. They do need help, and it's a blessed privilege sometimes to be a helper. Keep your eyes open, your heart warm. Go further than inviting people in these days to have elsewhere to go. I know a barber in High Point, North Carolina, got under conviction about a man. He's been trying to witness to him through the years. And he made up his mind. He's going to run the fellow out of the county or get him into a gospel service. And he'd go and the man would have a, an alibi, an excuse, and he'd just sit on his front step during the service. Next night, he'd show up, the fellow to have another alibi, and he sat on his front step for 13 successive nights until he landed it. Just keep on. If we knew how desperately seeked in sin this generation is, we would abandon our hop, skip, and jump methods, and we'd stand between somebody. I, we, I wish we'd quit win, trying to win everybody and try to win somebody. And that'd be a lot better, wouldn't it? Do your best. You're a gracious people. I want to give an illustration, if I can, to illustrate, to introduce my message tonight. I want to try to preach tonight on the God of the Bible versus the God of of today. I was in my own town where I live now from years since, in one of the big churches, and the big town on the board of deacons, he heard me one time, he decided he didn't like it. He's a fellow that the doctor told him to watch his stomach, so he put it way out in front of him so he could keep his eyes on it. And uh, he didn't come back to the meeting. He thought he took out, everybody else would, but God began to bring crowds and began to see. And so he decided, I learned all these things afterward, he decided maybe he better show up and see what's going on. And he came down after he heard me preach the second time, and very pompously said, young man, the God I worship won't do like you said your God does. And I said I'm agreeable to that. Perhaps your God won't punish sin, but the God of the Bible has set himself that since it's a race between two sovereigns, him and sin that he's going to win. You and I have been privileged or destined to live in the days when America has experienced the greatest revival of believing in God the world's ever known anything about. But there are many of us who are afraid that the God of the day is the creature of our own warped desires. And that once again, the days of the Apostle Paul are being repeated, and that the God who's so popular now, the man upstairs, the one whom the little Hollywood actress said he's a living doll, uh, be the good Lord willing of author Godfrey. 
the God who has smiled upon a brand of Christianity that turned the Lord's Day into a Roman holiday. That's not the God of the Bible. It has always been true that men prone are prone to create a God with whom they can be comfortable in their sin. And it seems to me that one of the great issues of this hour, a man would be a fool, go up and down America now, crying aloud, have faith in God. Everybody's already beat you to it. They've got a God. All the movie actresses now are religious. Jane Russell is either drunk or in a prayer meeting. This is true all the time. This is the day when everybody believes in God. Tonight we want to look at the God of the day and compare him with the God of the Bible. I believe it's Mr. Spurgeon who said that the best way to ascertain whether a stick was crooked was to lay it down on the ground or the floor and then take a perfectly straight stick and lay it beside the other. And the straight stick will reveal the crookedness of the other. And tonight I hope to say four things about the God of the Bible. When laid down beside the popular God of the day, reveal the crookedness of the popular God of that monster called Christendom that has more church members and more crimes and in a nation on top side of God's earth. The straight stick is this God that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of in John chapter 17 as he is praying to the Father in verse 2, he's thanking the Father, and he says, As thou hast given him, referring to himself, authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And then the Lord Jesus Christ tells us what life eternal is. And here in this context, it's, he's not talking about how long it lasts, but what it is while it lasts. This is life eternal. That they might know thee, might know thee, might know thee. It's a solemn thing that all through the Old Testament, I'm sure I'm right on this, all through the Old Testament, the word know and knowledge and so forth is used in this context as one of obedience. You know as much truth as you are practicing. You're under its rule. And to know God is to come under his rule and experience his rule in your own life. Another has put it, and I think rightly, in these words, that the only way Christ can be known is in discipleship. For well, we need in these days especially to get back to those phrases that occur so frequently in the book of Acts that Christianity in those days was called the way. It was not disassociated from a way of life. It was not some pie-in-the-sky thing wafting around in the sky, but it was practical. And men, when they became Christians, were positionized into a certain way. And the people who made fun of the things of Christ called the people the people of the way, the people of the way. And the Lord Jesus here in our text says, This is life eternal. It comes from the hand of the exalted Lord. All life, we are told by him, is in him, and he gives life. 
and he gives eternal life, and eternal life is to know thee, the only true God, to know by experience, to by discipleship, by obedience, if you please, this is life eternal, to know thee, the only true God, the only true God, the only true God, that's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If we turn to the book of Romans, at chapter 1, we're introduced to the world of the Apostle Paul's day, and you'd think you're reading the front page of your daily newspaper once again to read the first chapter of the book of Romans. In this sense, it seems like that history is repeating itself and that we can pick up the book of Romans which describes the character of people and the condition of the world when Paul wrote and looked like he just penned the day before yesterday and it's front page news and it's hot off the wire. And in this chapter, the apostle Paul speaks of man creating fashion in his own God. And we'll begin reading with the 16th verse, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Christ. And the reason I'm not ashamed of it, I'm not confused about it, it is, it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein this gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And while we're not teaching a study course tonight, it's well for us to pause a moment and remember that the righteousness of God is not so much an attribute of God, but the righteousness of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he it is who's revealed in the gospel, for the gospel is Christ, and Christ is the gospel and they cannot be separated. And the, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. Christ is made real to men and women by the Holy Ghost in the old, old story from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold down is the rendering there. They are active about it. They're not passive. They hold it down. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They hold down truth so they can be comfortable in their unrighteous, ungodly way of living. And to do that because that which may be known of God is manifest into them. And they've got to have relief. Men are not going to split hell wide open because they're a bunch of dumbbells and ignoramuses. Unbelief isn't the absence of faith. Unbelief isn't passive, it's active. Unbelief is the willful rejection of truth. And certainly we are facing that today. Men and women who have been brought face to face with truth and they had to do something about it. So they got them a sledgehammer and pounced it back into the earth lest their way of licentious living should have to go by way of the board. It is one of the most startling things that I've ever faced as a preacher. I hope you'll not get shocked about it, that the fastest growing sin in America tonight is homosexuality. Did you know that one out of every ten people living in New York City is a male or a female homosexual? 
There are over 70,000 homosexual male or female prostitutes walking the streets of New York City. Are you aware of the fact, and I do not chase jackrabbits much, but this is so solemn I mention it. Are you aware of the fact that the fashion industry is now controlled lock, stock, and barrel by homosexuals? Are you aware of the fact, and I can name some, but I won't, lest I'd have to go to court to prove it, that many of the more popular television programs, no one can even work as a stagehand on those programs that isn't either a male or a female homosexual. We're at Sodom now. We're, we're down to Sodom, and that's as low as you can go. That's as low as you can go. I wonder how we could stand on the street corners or get on television or somewhere, and without doing harm, I wish we could wave the red flag to the womanhood of America. And it breaks my heart that it's invaded church life now. Did you know there have been marriages performed by so-called Christian ministers in the United States marrying males to males and females to females? Did you know the reason for the sloppy dress of womankind now? There is a desperate plot hatched out of hell to destroy the race by ruining the attractiveness of the female sex. Oh, I know we'll be thought crab apples, but it's not merely that people have gone so bad in our day. It's the fact that the times have come upon us of active suppression of the truth of righteousness. And from every hand, the very demons out of hell are controlling this world. I know it's a trite saying, and the preachers use it. There never was such a day, but under God there never was such a day. And the end of the ages, apparently, has come upon us. Oh, when we know, and I said all that to say, that men who deal with what I'm talking about now go so far as to say there is no salvation nor cure for people who've gone that far. And when I tell you this, I'm using the thought and the labor and the findings of men who deal with it. And they tell me that the majority of the sodomites of the day were raised in Christian atmosphere and were brought face to face with truth. And they had to do something with it, so they pressed it down, held it down, suppressed it. And blindly, like a fullback, plowed through the truth. To get them a God with whom they could be comfortable in their sin. And that's what the rest of the chapter talks about. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. One of the paradoxes of the Bible that no man can explain is this. 
If anybody gets saved, it'll be God's fault. If anybody's sent to hell, it'll be his fault. Men are utterly without excuse. All men are without excuse. There has never lived a human being who did not blindly, like a bulldog, deliberately press down what he knew about God and God's truth so that he could continue to be comfortable in his lawless life. You'll never meet a man who's who has an excuse. All are without excuse. Why are they without excuse? Well, the next verse tells us, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and therefore their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they became such such fools as the next verses describe. They were such fools that they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. They got their own little pocket knife and they whittled them out of God. Like the corruptible man. But he is a little too holy. And so they threw him aside and got their Barlow knife and whittled them of God like in the bird. That was a little too tight, so they got their knives and they whittled them gods like four-footed beasts. And they wound up creating the gods after the image of creeping things. Wherefore, God pushed them. No, no. Wherefore, God took his hand off. Wherefore, God, who loves people more than you do, wherefore, God, who desires the salvation of men more than you do, wherefore, God, also gave them up three times. There's a deepening echo in the remaining part of this chapter. God gave them up. God gave them up. That's courage. When God throws up his hand. I shall never get over many, many years ago. I went to the Bowery Mission in New York City. It is at the tail end almost. It is still a terrible depression. And I preached the week in the Bowery Mission. Second Avenue in the Bowery and those streets is near hills I've ever been. Not safe for a woman to walk those streets in the daytime, much less night. And it's not safe for a man to walk them at night. I spent the nights with the superintendent, some of them going around the wee hours of the morning, digging out drunks. They just got them some smoke. They could buy a half a pint for a dime. And it put them out and they'd get a newspaper put over their head and hunt the nearest crack where they could lie down. The snow would cover them up and people go all over that section of New York City in the dead winter hours and shovel them up if he's dead to take him to the morgue and if he wasn't to take him to the mission. About a, 
unsawing. I saw sin. I never forget the first night I preached. And the superintendent I went to school with, and we were buddies. And uh, he said, Now, Ralph, you bring a good gospel message tonight. Pour your heart out to these men. When you finish, you turn the service over to me. But I said, Al, that was his given name. Uh, maybe the Lord want me to invite them to repent. Oh, he said, you mustn't do that. And I said, what do you mean? You going modernist on the horn? Oh, he said, but when you get through preaching, you turn it over to me. And I argued with him a little bit. And he said, now I know what I'm doing. He said, every one of those 800 men, the only reason didn't have more than 800, that's all he could pack and jam in there. And they preached to them for they fed them, combed the lice out of them, gave them a place to sleep. And they were ex-doctors and ex-preachers and ex-bankers and ex-everything. The heart of the depression come to bow. That's about as far as you can get on the road to hell in this country. And he says, every one of those 800 men want to be saved, every last one of them. Maybe they don't understand what salvation means, but they sure wish they weren't in the mess they're in. And he said, if you give what we know as a public invitation, they'd kill each other to see who'd get down there the quickest. And he said, they'll do anything on God's earth you ask them to do. You've ever preached to the Negroes of the South. I've preached to them many times. They'll do anything on earth you ask them to do. And don't mean a thing. They keep right on the way they've been living. And uh, he said, now, and if, and if they came down there, you ask them to save yes, sir. Ask them if they'll pray, they'll pray. Ask them if they'll receive the Lord, yes, sir. They'll do anything you ask them to do. He said, when they get through the service, if you give one of them a dime, he kills somebody to get out of there and go buy that drink that puts them out so they forget the hell they're in for a little while. And then he said to me, and you preacher brethren will understand what I'm saying. He said, I wish every preacher in the United States come spend a week or two here on the Bowery and see what sin will do. It'll bring men down so deep that this great big will we hear a lot about is completely sold out, and they've got nothing within them to lay hold of truth with. I thought about it a lot. The Bible talks something about that. When a man starts down hill and he reaches the bottom and there he is apparently God's given us his will go everything he's got within him that could savingly respond to parents I say apparently because I'm not an authority and I'm just hinting at something I've seen well no well I can explain it or not God gives people up. God gives people up. What kind of God do you worship? What kind of God do you worship? It's a solemn thing to remember that whether we like it or not, men and women are not nice people. If people were hungry for holiness, searching for God and panting for righteousness and haters of iniquity and lovers of the rule of God and the one thing but the scriptures say that's not so sin today is perhaps never before manifest itself as self will self love and thus this self will and self love shows up where you can get your hand on it in lawlessness if there's one word that characterizes people today 
It's a spirit of lawlessness is breaking out everywhere. In church, in the hall, in the school. Some of you northern cities, the teachers hardly dare show up, try to teach. The kids will cut them or shoot them or something else. And anything on earth that people don't like now, or they organize a parade to protest. It's broken out everywhere. And more and more we're reaping the fruit of every man to himself, and the devil takes the hindmost. This is the law, is it? The law will not allow the policeman or God to interfere with our vaunted freedom. And sure enough, it's the old self-will and the self-love that's got the mayors and the president and everybody else in America. It caused one leading preacher the other day to predict that within five years in every village, much less city, we'll have lawless riots that'll make the Watts community in Los Angeles look like a Sunday school picture. I talked the other day with some people right in the middle of that thing out in Los Angeles. Oh, this lawless age. What is it? It's the self-love and self-will of man breaking loose and becoming manic and lawless. Let's go a deeper word than that. We're not dealing with nice people. We're dealing with people of whom the scriptures say the heart are the hearts are seats of hostility to God. Years since I saw that verse, Romans eight and seven. I saw for what it meant, and I'm still not able to understand it. It's too tremendous for me. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, the carnal mind is enmity. It doesn't say it's at enmity. It is enmity. And the deeper word, I think, that renders the original, the carnal mind is hostility. I have wanted one time before the Lord comes or I die, whichever it is, his will. I'd love to preach one sermon and have enough of the anointing of the Holy Ghost to open that awful truth to people. This mind and the mind in the New Testament's the whole shoot man. It means that the thing that makes Ralph Barnard pick apart from Christ is itself hostility. And the thing that rouses the enmity of the hostility is the law of Almighty God. Our nature is a seed. It's a heart bed of hostility to God. The thing that arouses my enmity and hostility is the law of God. It's not subject, the verse continues, to the law of God. Neither can it. Oh, what's the matter with man? That they do a lot of things that's bad enough. That they shake their fist at God, that's bad enough. That they trample every one of his commandments they know of under their feet. That they blow the smoke of their unbelief in the holy nostrils of Jesus Christ. 
that they do desperate to the Holy Ghost every day of the life. That's bad enough. You still haven't got to the depths of it. They are themselves seeds of hostility to God on the throne. Everywhere I go, there's one thing I hear. There may be some difference in communities and some in peoples I do not know. But everywhere in America, you can put your feet on solid ground. And you talk to God's people and God's preachers. You hear one thing, Brother Barnard, there's not much conviction of sin in our community. No. And that makes me want to go to the mourner's bench. Because there hadn't been much honest to God opening of the real seed of the trouble. And I can preach on chewing the backer. And a man will say, well, I guess that's pretty bad. But I don't think it's any worse than doing something else. Down south, if you preach on it, they'll say, well, I don't think that's half as bad as pulling off all your clothes and going in with mixed bays like you Yankees do. Or I can preach on something else, and they will say, I don't believe that's any worse than something else. And there's no conviction. But if somehow or another, God Almighty would give an outpouring to his preachers one more time, and with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, we could take the surgeon knife of the truth of God and open up the vile hearts of men and let the snakes of hatred against holiness come out. Maybe somebody would say, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Nearly everything people can compare it now, but the scriptures say, but inside is a hot bed of enmity and hostility. So Almighty God, as the lawgiver and the moral ruler of this universe, Men aren't just some people that do some bad things. Men are people who are themselves hostile to the rule of God. If we want to hear men screaming, is there any hope for such a vile wretch as I am? Once again in America, maybe we're going to have to throw alibis away and just camp right here a little bit. Oh, the hostility against the holiness of God is rampant today. And by God's help, I covet for myself and every preacher in America who stands to speak to eternity bound men and women to roll up our sleeves and spit on our hands and seek to tell men the truth, tell it in love, but tell it! The trouble with men and women is not what they do. The trouble with men and women is what they are! We'll never seek conviction much again. So we spend less time cutting sprouts and just keep shooting at the vile, hostile, and inimical hearts and minds. Men and women who are sad in their hostility to the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is a holy God. The 
popular God does not even frown on the frivolity of present-day so-called churchanity. I am greatly alarmed. I've studied history a little bit and I've read the Bible a little. To me, the most alarming thing about America tonight is what's happening to the Lord's Day. I'm an old fogey. I believe the next step after doing away with God's holy day will be to do away with God. I believe that with all my heart. I'm too far removed from the old Puritans. We could do with a little of their theology and a few of their convictions. But I'm thinned out too much from them to be, I guess, a Puritan. Oh, God, I wish we could have a wave of conviction sweep over America. That this is the Lord's day. I think it is crystal clear that the next step after doing away with the Lord's day is to do away with God. You're familiar with the fact that the officials of France, by picture and symbol, took God to the borders of France and told him never to come back, and apparently he hadn't. You can go through city after city and village after village and village after village and city after city in France. Not any kind of a church service. Not any kind. Catholic, Baptist, name it. Not any kind. The next step for America. After desecrating and profane and snubbing God about this one day, to be to leave God outside of our borders and forget him to forbid him to come back. I do not know your theology, but I cannot accept. All of this arguing about the Sabbath and we've done away with it. Now I understand those things, but there's a principle as deep as the character of God. It needs to be resounded today about the first day of the week. This is the Lord's day. Let us be glad. Holiness. 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 My old Hebrew professor in the seminary used to write on my papers, maybe in 30 years from now you'll be a preacher, boy. Keep on! And he said, he'd write my given name, Rob, be one preacher who preaches the holiness of God. My mother's father was an old-time Baptist preacher. He is so narrow-minded and puritanical. His children couldn't even play croquet on the Lord's Day. Now it's the day of down our country. Everybody's got money enough, goes to the stock car races. Guess when they're held? On the Lord's Day. And what you do up here in our country, if it ain't raining or snowing, you don't dare get on the highways 250 miles to the beaches, and God professing people go almost bumper to bumper. That professing Christians are leading the march to destroy every remembrance of a holy God in America. Do away with the Lord's day, and you've done away with this church, brother. And when you do that, you're through. Pilate brought the Lord Jesus Christ before him. 
And Pilate naturally would think that it is his to dispose of Christ. In verse 16, of course, of John 19, Pilate said unto the Lord, Speakest thou not unto me? Christ wouldn't give him an answer. Don't you know that I have power to crucify thee? That I have power to release thee? Humanly speaking, that so. But notice the answer the Lord gave. The Lord answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Isn't that a solemn scripture? I think what I tell you what I think we can do. I think you can preach that God can command the winds and the waves to obey him and everybody. Says, oh, that's the kind of God I believe in. I think you can go far enough now to preach and marvel that God can raise men from the dead like he did last, the Lord. And people say, Amen. I think you can preach that God can command the evil spirit like he did in the went and got in the hogs and went and destroyed the People say, Amen. But if you preach that God has power over man in his inmost being, We've got a dogfight on our hands. He said to Abimelech, I kept you from sinning with Abraham's wife. He comes to a man sitting at the post of being a tax collector and said, Leave it, come and follow me. And he does. The most solemn thought that I have a face and I know I don't know how to preach it. It sounds so cruel and so harsh. But I know it's the truth that the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ holds the destiny of men in his hands. And that men ought to find that out in our day. I believe with all of my heart in decision in its proper place. I believe in public profession in its proper place. Proper place. But I think the missing note that this generation is going to go to hell and never hear, broadly speaking, is that men in relation to God are just exactly like Pilate and the Lord. Pilate can move only as a power bigger than he is allows him to. Men, when all said and done, are in the hands of Almighty God, who has a right, and he's pleased to exercise it, to do as he will. I do not believe that anybody will ever have much appreciation for God's wondrous mercy until we take it out of the marketplace and place it once again in the bloodstained hand of Christ and start telling men and women now you can't experience his mercy while you're rejecting him. It's in his hand. The God of the Bible is the God of power, power over me. Power over me. I'm this much of an old fatalist. I can't explain it. I just expound it. Nothing can rise or wriggle apart from Almighty God. He's on the throne. If we could preach a God who does, who saves people in a way other than grace, People would love him. The God of this Bible, the manufacturer of the great religious revival we've had, got everybody believing in God and living in sin. It's different from the God who saves people in spite of. That's the deep meaning of grace. By grace are you saved. If we could preach that men deserve salvation, if we could preach that men do it themselves, but if we preach that it's a gift of God, 
it must be the truth that we are hostile to God. When we remember that men hate that more than anything this side of here, that our situation so desperate, our natures are so vile, that if God saves us, he has to save us in spite of us. And finally, only motive to save sinners within the goodness of his own heart. The God of the Bible is sworn to bring judgment on sin. And surely the popular God won't punish sin. The only commandment people seem to be afraid of now is the eleventh, thou shalt not get caught. But the God of the Bible is sworn that he by no means clear the guilty. The God of the Bible is still the same God that says the soul that sinneth it shall die. The God of the Bible is the God who sends men to hell. The wicked shall be sent to hell. And all the nations that forget God. The God of the Bible sends men to hell. That's awful, but the God of the Bible sends men to hell. The scriptures, I think, say he sends men to hell for two reasons. First, the God of the Bible sends men to hell to preserve. Thank God to preserve and restrain the damaged, rebellious rebels would do if he didn't. I do not believe that we do service to the character of God by trying to soften this blow. I'm familiar with that half-truth that God doesn't send men to hell, they send themselves to some truth that's by not any means all the truth. And we do not do service to a God whom we know is a God of love. If we do not understand that his love is so pure and his love is so holy, that he is determined that when he creates the new heavens and the new earth, nothing that defileth shall enter in. And to restrain the damage that rebellious men unregenerated by the spirit and uncleansed by the blood would do. God Almighty, Sends men to hell. There's a verse of scripture, kind of one of my shouting ground verses of scripture. I love to quote it now and then when I'm sort of under the juniper tree. Nevertheless, we look according to his promise. What for? You have it, and you are. Wherein dwelleth righteousness? If I'm right, you read the book of Psalms, you'll find many times in the book of Psalms terrible judgments come on the enemy that God may be merciful to his people. I don't know. God loves his people. Oh, God more than his people love him. And he's not going to let some rebel turn the new Jerusalem into another hell. None of them. None of them. He's not going to do it. But the scriptures, of course, are crystal clear that the main reason God judges and sends men to hell is to punish them, not to correct them, but to punish 
We're here where we only can worship. And I think not in her end, but God set the punishment. The punishment. All of us put together couldn't prove our conception of sin and come close to how highness it must be if a God who's a God of love is determined to punish sin by sending men the eternal hell. Sin must be awful. It must be a terrible thing to be a rebel in God's world and to hate his holiness and to despise his rule and to trample his love. Hell isn't a place of correction. It's a place where a thrice holy God unbears his arm and punishes men for their sins. I was down in Mobile, Alabama. They put me on the radio. It's one of these so-called union meetings. All the Baptist churches in town got together. We were trying to make an impact. And the Lord did give us a little blessing. And the radio got I don't know, fire struck me. And I, I, I preached on judgment. I just preached on judgment. Hell, I couldn't preach on anything else. And it got awful hot. And it got to where people talking on the street and, and people under conviction. I couldn't get off of it. And finally, the big shots in the town, the big religious people, it got on their nerves and began to telephone and right and, and buttonhole the manager of the station. He wasn't a Christian. And they demanded that they put me off there. This is why our children can't sleep at night. And all we can hear all over this city. I love to see it happen somewhere else. And the people at least conscious that there might probably be a sin hating, sin punishing God. That when he hung his son on the cross, he wasn't exercising a little Sunday afternoon drill. He was doing the only thing that can be done to provide a way of escape from the awful wrath of a holy God against sin. A man just called me in. He said they put the fire under me. They're threatening to get in touch with the radio commission. They're going to do this and that and the other. They're really making it hot. I said, why? I wouldn't cause you any trouble. And uh, and you just, you won't put me off so all right. He said, no, sir. He said, preacher, I ain't a Christian, but he said, I sure wish I was. And then he cussed a little bit. He said, if you'll keep on preaching hell, I'll keep you on till hell freezes over. I don't know that may shock you. And he wouldn't put me off. And he got saved for it's over. And I got a letter from a nice, pious church member. And he was very sweet. And he said, young man, he said, I've been listening to you. And I'm an old man. And I want to offer a word of counsel to you. I hope you'll take it in the spirit in which it's given. I have no doubt he is well-meaning. He said, young man, it won't do. Sinners are better good for God to send them to hell. And the next day, without mentioning his name, and I think without getting in the flesh myself, I called attention to the fact that I'd received a letter from a man, and he told me, that it wouldn't do sinners any good for God to send them to hell. And I said the man was right. But that ain't why God sends men to hell. I know I can't understand it. I couldn't explain it to anybody. I don't want to believe it. Don't read I believe it. It's in the book. 
God don't send people to hell to do them good. God help us. I wish our hearts could break about it. I wish our icicles would melt. I wish we'd kind of get a little alarmed about it. God sends people to hell to punish them. That's why I send people to hell, to punish them. That's why I send people to hell, not doing good, but to punish them. And as a boy on the farm, I had a black shepherd dog. That's the smartest dog anybody ever had. Boy, he is a crackerjack. I taught him every kind of trick he'd mind. They'd do whatever I told him to do. And one day I passed by him and he snapped at me. And I looked at him and some old white stuff was drooling out of his mouth. And it scared me. I just little fella. And I ran to Papa and I said, Papa, something wrong with Chef. And Papa came out of the house and stood on the porch and looked at Chef and he grabbed me and put me back in the house and said, Stay there! And he went up to the mantel and got the shotgun and went out on the porch and it took a bead. And he shot old Chef right square between the eyes. And I cried like my heart would break. And my daddy tried to explain to me he never did succeed. He said, Chef's mad. And the only thing you can do with a mad dog to get rid of them. Oh, men and women. God's not going to take men to glory to turn it into hell. And the only thing even a holy God can do else he's a monster. If a man wades through his life here on God's earth, if a man lives the days of his life here on God's earth, that has been visited by the man Christ Jesus. Where at? bit of the soil as a little bit of the shed blood of Jesus Christ that mingled and flowed in the Palestine soil. Now the times have spread as well. So that I believe I'm scientific and I say when you go out and step on Mother Earth as a little bit of the shed blood of Jesus Christ this is a bad old world. There's one thing about it that's wonderful. God thought enough of it to visit it and die on a cross. And if a man wades through that, there's nothing God can do except sin in the hell. That's right. The God of the Bible judges sin. God of the Bible is going to punish sin. There's no hope for our partners. Except as I can be united to him. Who one day in time Right here on this earth was nailed to a cross. And God vented his spleen, poured out his wrath.
And as he took my place, he endured my hell. If hell is any more than my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's hell. My only hope, my only plea, is Christ Jesus died and he died for me. An infidel met old John Jasper, the colored preacher, and said, Brother Jasper, said, suppose you've been right all this preaching you've done. Suppose when you die you go to hell. Brother John said, Suppose I dies and goes to hell. Soon as my feet touch down there, I gonna start a testimony meeting. Praising the Lord Jesus for dying in my stead. And said the devil ain't gonna let me stay. He's gonna kick me out. Oh, Have you been joined by faith to him?